Welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of my podcast. This is Dr. Andrew Weil. I'm, I must start by saying you are my first and most powerful inspiration for everything that has to do in my adapting a healthy lifestyle. And I'm so happy you're here to catch up and also to share you with all of my audience. Oh, thank you, Norma. It is a great delight to be here and to see you again. So you're in New York for what reason? There's a press event uh, tonight for True Food Kitchen, the restaurant mm -hmm. concept that I started. Uh, we now have 29 of wow. them throughout the country, all doing very well. This is uh, delicious, healthy food. And uh, the press event is to talk about our East Coast expansion plans. So tell us, tell us about so, it. So uh, this see, it's now 11 years ago. Um, well, over the years, I'm a very good home cook. And people said, you ought to start a restaurant. I was smart enough to know that I knew nothing about the <laughs> restaurant business, and it looked like a tough business. Right. But uh, about 12 years ago, a mutual friend introduced me to a successful restaurateur in Arizona, and I proposed him the concept of a restaurant that would serve really good food that was healthy. He didn't get it. He said, health food doesn't sell. And I think he thought I meant tofu and sprouts. Mm -hmm. So I invited him and his wife to my home. I cooked a meal for them. They liked the food. And his wheels slowly started to turn. And yeah. he said, well, he was willing to give it a try. He was very skeptical. We opened the first one in Phoenix, just as the economy tanked. And everyone mm -hmm. said we were crazy. And from the moment it opened, it was a tremendous wow. success. And as I say, now there are 29 of them. And the menu is very creative. I think one reason it works is there's something for everyone. So people who are meat eaters, vegetarians, vegans, gluten-free people, keto people, you know, there's something for everyone there. But oh, great. first and foremost, the food is beautiful and delicious, and it happens to conform to my nutritional philosophy mm -hmm. of an anti-inflammatory diet. And so I, I'm really thinking so much again about anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. that word, and yeah. how um, critical it is to just just the process of aging, of living life. So talk about that. Sure. Well, we all know inflammation on the surface of the body. It's local redness, mm -hmm. heat, swelling, and pain at an area that's injured or under attack. Uh, inflammation is actually the cornerstone of the body's healing response. It's how the body gets more nourishment and more immune activity to an area that's injured or under attack. Uh, but inflammation is so powerful and it's so potentially destructive that it's very important that it stay where it's supposed to stay and end when it's supposed to end. Mm -hmm. If inflammation serves no purpose, if it persists, uh, extends beyond its boundaries in time and space, it becomes productive of disease. Um, it's very important that you be able to produce enough inflammation because if you can't, you're vulnerable to infection, mm -hmm. but not produce too much because then you can get allergies and autoimmunity. But the really interesting new idea on the medical horizon is that chronic low level imperceptible inflammation is the root cause of most of the serious age-related diseases that kill and disable people prematurely. Cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases like Al Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and cancer because anything that increases inflammation also stimulates cells to divide more mm -hmm. frequently. So the good news here is that uh, all these diseases, which when I was in medical school, I was taught they were completely unrelated. If they have a common root, then there's a common strategy for dealing with them. And that is to contain inappropriate mm -hmm. inflammation. Uh, there's a lot of influences on your inflammatory status, genetics, stress, environmental toxins, secondhand tobacco smoke is strongly pro-inflammatory. Mm. But diet has a huge influence. Yeah. And the mainstream North American diet is strongly pro-inflammatory. It gives us the wrong fats, wrong carbs, and not enough of the protective elements right. that are mostly found in fruits, vegetables, herbs, and spices. So I designed an anti-inflammatory diet. I based it on the Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. because we have so much evidence that that's... Right the good way to eat yeah. and everybody likes it and uh, then I tweaked that by adding Asian influences because I spent a lot of time in Japan and, mm -hmm. and other parts of East Asia so I added mushrooms and turmeric and ginger and green tea and uh, so came up with an anti-inflammatory diet mm -hmm. and an anti-inflammatory diet pyramid uh, at the very top of the pyramid is dark chocolate, which I consider a health food. I uh, do and, too. <laughs> good, <laughs> good. And uh, so that's really the nutritional philosophy that that uh, True Food Kitchen is yeah. based on. And um, so obviously, I agree. Diet really is everything. You can almost feel the difference. Yeah. 
from from one week to the next if you change your diet yeah. it's unbelievable um is there anything else uh, for inflammation that well, you think? Well, you know, I mentioned uh, turmeric. The, the most powerful natural anti-inflammatory agent is turmeric. Right. Uh, ginger, which is closely related, also has that effect. Um, green tea has that effect. Mm-hmm. You know, many there are many things out there. Um, and then I think you know, reducing stress, having good physical activity, right. getting good rest and sleep, which yeah. many people don't. Uh, you know, all very sensible. Yeah. But I think the the first rule of the anti-inflammatory diet is to stop eating refined, processed, and manufactured mm. food. Yeah. I mean, that's simple. That's what's doing us in. Mm. Um, you know, it's been said that our great-grandparents wouldn't recognize what most people eat today. Yeah. And it's true. And you've been saying this a long for, time. I, I can't even remember the day I met you, but or the first day I ever went to Miraval. Yeah. Um, was so long ago, but what you were saying then I remember coming back to New York and not really talking to a lot of people about what I was doing because they weren't interested. <laughs> and if I would say something, they said, you're so kooky. Yeah, and right, I think, I, all right, I guess, I, I don't know. But I remember every word you said so many, so many years ago. And this is, you've been saying this for as long as I, from the day I met yeah. you. And I thought, oh my God, well, oh, thank God. I love ginger. I love green tea. <laughs> I can go for this. And then, um, so I have one question about turmeric. So much, there was like turmeric trend and yeah, you know yeah. how there's a trend for everything. Um, and so there are so many different types of turmeric. First of all, I, I am in the middle of the stress center mm-hmm. of the world, right. right? And so to avoid stress, this space here, by the way, at 1230 every day, we close the building for meditation. Great. And this actually was requested by my staff. Uh-huh. And so that's super helpful for stress. But I think in a city like this, we need not only a good diet, but we need something else. So I've looked at lots of different types of turmeric. Do you think um, liquid is better? Or? Well, uh, if you're going, to, I mean, I think it's good to add turmeric to food. Right. Um, we don't have much of a tradition of doing that. Right. I had a, a student, an, an Indian physician, who was a very good cook, and she taught her patients to try adding a level teaspoon of turmeric to bean dishes and mm-hmm. stews and soups. You know, at that level, it's palatable and mm. good. I think if you want to take turmeric for a specific inflammatory condition like arthritis, probably best take it in supplement form. And you want to take it in a preparation that has black pepper in it or a black pepper extract oh, right. to make um, it absorbable. Yeah. Um, I think there are good preparations out there. I, I personally prefer whole turmeric to isolated curcumin mm-hmm. because I think there's other things in turmeric that mm-hmm. work. Um, so there's a number of good supplements out there. Just make sure that it's, I, I don't think it matters whether it's a liquid or a tablet. I have I have a delicious dressing with turmeric. Mm-hmm. Um, I love raw vegetables. Yeah. And um, on cauliflower, I to do olive oil, lemon, little sea salt, and lots of turmeric. Oh, I'm going to try that. It's so tangy and delicious oh, and crunchy. And then if you let it stay overnight, it sort of marinates oh, the I'm, cauliflower. I'm, that sounds great. So it is. It's a good munchy kind of... You have to be careful about it staining things, as it, you know. Yeah, like your teeth. <laughs> like your teeth. <laughs> and yeah. by the way, you know, you mentioned the meditation here. The, the most effective, time-efficient uh, stress reducer I know is a simple breathing exercise. And you probably have heard or seen my 478 mm-hmm. breathing yeah, technique. I, you yes. know, anyone can find that if you just put my name. Yeah, it's so great. It's breath. so it simple. It takes 30 seconds yeah. and remarkable effects. Well, one of the things, so, you know, I have a very diverse group here mm-hmm. because we have a sample room and the sales yeah. and office. And so everybody comes from a different place with a different understanding of what meditation is. Yeah. And but everybody wants to try it. And at the beginning, I noticed that nobody felt comfortable sitting in mm-hmm. the position. So I got a whole bunch of pillows and mats and still not so comfortable. And so then I just invited everybody to come lie down who wanted to lie down, who'd never done meditation and just breathe. Mm-hmm. And so we did a series of breathing, but Great. lying down. Great. Um, and then I had somebody come in and do body scans, so now they can sort of do. So mm-hmm. we're working. Not some people just Good. 
But so you know, it, the essence of meditation is it's nothing other than focused exactly. attention. Exactly. And I think the goal, it's fine to do sitting practice with that, but the real goal is to be able to carry that state throughout the day. Yeah. So whatever you're doing, you, your attention is focused and not yeah. wandering off in this and that. For me, uh, cooking is a meditation. Yeah. And I've often said that chopping vegetables and yeah. you know everything else disappears and I'm totally focused on that. Yeah, I, I have that with sketching, I'm sure, obviously. I'm sure. But the, um, the interesting thing is that even when people are snoring, and, mm -hmm. and I think, you know what? That's okay. It's the, okay. It's okay. Right. It's a break. And one of the, the inspirations for me is, I spend a lot of time in the Middle East, and the call to prayer to me is a very interesting uh -huh. concept uh -huh. because for whatever the religious concept of it is, I think it's also a decision that everybody comes together and s steps away from their stalls or for wherever their work is, and they separate for exactly. 15 minutes. Exactly. Right? And, and I feel like religion in our society is under question. I mm -hmm. mean, some people don't want to believe, some people deeply believe. There's a lot of controversy. But I think we need, as a society, a, a coming together for wellness at different periods or times. Mm -hmm. And even if it's one time a day yeah, that we all wise. stop, I, we need something to join us because we're very sort of broken apart about religion and yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. There's a I grounding. was with a... Uh, a uh, meditation teacher, uh, he was, we were participating in a small group meeting that was about changing medical education and he was facilitating mm -hmm. the meeting. And periodically at random times he would just ring a bell and just ask us to drop into our breathing for a few seconds even to remind us of that. And I think to have some sort yeah. of practice like that is very useful. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely thinking more and more that uh, as as a country, mm -hmm. we need unifying things, mm -hmm. and this would, well. That's a good one. <laughs> I, I would love it. <clears throat> so besides the anti-inflammatory concept, there are so many things that I remember you talking about first, and I remember the conversation about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And I never heard anybody, and I remember the first time you talked about mushrooms, yeah. and you said, this is something that I'm, this is new and I want to share it with you. And so tell me about the discovery and where you are today on the subject. So in the, I would say the early, late 1970s, early 1980s, I was very interested in traditional Chinese medicine, which not many people knew about. So I began reading up on Chinese medical philosophy. And uh, I was fascinated by how important mushrooms were in their traditional med medicine. Mm -hmm. um, they're called superior drugs and they were recommended for all sorts of things. And that seemed, it seemed especially odd that in the West, nobody had paid attention to mushrooms as potential medicines. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, the general belief here was that mushrooms had no nutritional value, which is not true, that they were likely to be harmful and nobody right. had explored them for medical uses. So I began reading about medicinal mushrooms then on trips to Japan and China. I met scientists who were doing research on them. And I began to w awaken interest here in that. So that's been a long interest. And now I'm delighted to say there's a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of research especially on a lot of these Asian mushrooms, some of which are food mushrooms, uh, like shiitake and maitake, mm -hmm. and some of which are too bitter or woody to be used as food, but are made into extracts or teas, right. like reishi, for example. Right. And one uh, common property of a lot of these mushrooms, first of all, they're all non-toxic, and you can use them long term, but many of them uh, affect the immune system in ways that make us more resistant to cancer, mm -hmm. uh, to infections by both bacteria and viruses. Uh, some have been used as cancer treatments. Uh, some, like reishi, have powerful anti-inflammatory effects mm -hmm. equivalent to ibuprofen. Uh, there's one called lion's mane that's a food mushroom, uh, but has a nerve growth factor in it and seems very useful for people with neuropathy. May also help with cognitive function. So there's a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. out there. So the bottom line is it's good to include mushrooms in the diet. And it's also, you know, if you can't do that easily, to take mushroom supplements. And what about the teas? Do they make sense? Or they? Yeah, I mean, as I said, some of them, like reishi, the it, it's a bitter, bitter. tea, so yeah. it's unpalatable. Others, others of them, uh, you know, like cordyceps, which people use mm -hmm. for energy, that has a very pleasant taste. Chinese cook it in soup, but I think for many people, it's easier to take these as liquid mm -hmm. or liquider. 
or solid extract. What about in smoothies? Would you suggest? Sure, if they don't have a you know a bad better, taste, yeah. and some of them like lion's mane and cordyceps have are pleasant tasting. Yeah, yeah, that's fine to do that. So um, one of the things I've um, discovered is as I've gotten older, my bones are like a real issue for me, right. and so. I've had the best doctors, done every protocol under the sun, and I, I'm very flexible. I can do a split. I can do everything. So you can tell me my bones aren't right, but I don't have any pain, and I'm not showing the yep. signs of it. So I decided since I couldn't see it, like you can see something, I needed to deal with this yep. myself because I'm taking this medication. So right. I decided to go back to um, nutritional powders and start to put combinations together that I thought would be helpful for my bones because obviously I'm mm -hmm. having an absorption mm -hmm. issue. And so I started to do this and I had blood tests not too long ago and there are two tests that I'm taking and one put me right into normal and they were shocked. And I actually was shocked too because I thought, I know, I'm, how am I going to make, these are experts, how am I going to make this happen? Um, but it's amazing that there is, that food and nutrition really are the most powerful healers. What, what in your life experience have you seen either nutritional powders or food or whatever really sort of show the most evidence of change and what what with happened. bone health particularly or, yeah well i would say first of all there's been i think misinformation out there about calcium uh, I think we've told women to take far too much calcium. And here's an interesting fact that I think people don't know. The countries with the highest calcium intake have the highest rates of hip fractures. And the countries with the highest dairy intake have the highest rates mm -hmm. of hip fractures. And the dairy industry has been telling us, you know, that we build strong bones by drinking right. milk. Right. Not so. No. Uh, the key to um, the body's being able to absorb and use calcium as vitamin D. So it's very important to have your vitamin D in mm -hmm. the high optimum range. And you, and you should get your blood level of vitamin D tested mm -hmm. to see where you are, because if it's very low, you may have to take some high doses of supplements to get it up. Uh, sun exposure is the best way to get mm -hmm. it. You have to be cautious about that, right. obviously, right. but it is. And I think if you've got uh, enough vitamin D, you should be able to absorb and use calcium from diet without mm -hmm. having to take supplements. If you do take supplements, I don't think you should take more than 500 to 700 milligrams of calcium mm -hmm. citrate a day. So that's first. Then there's other trace elements like strontium, for example, vitamin K that are useful for right. bone health and you can get the green tea is a good source of some of those things. Um, and then as you know, weight bearing exercise mm -hmm. is key. Definitely. Uh, and it's also important, I think this is especially uh, important to get this information to young people. All the bone mass and all the muscle mass that you have for life is built up in early life up till say the mid 20s, late 20s. After that, it's all downhill and all you can do is slow loss. You can't add anything new. Right. So I think it's really important to, for young people to understand that in that time of life, that's when you really want to uh, eat right, great. exercise right, not engage in habits like smoking or drinking a right. lot of soda that cause loss of a bone mineral. That's such great advice. That's a, that's so amazing, actually. Yeah, and many people don't think yeah. of that, but that's when you can make a difference. So, an observation. <clears throat> Since the last time I saw you, yeah. I've seen generations come through the company, mm -hmm. and I notice more and more that, and I have a lot of women here, girls in their 20s are going gray. Huh. Yeah. That's huh. an interesting observation. Very interesting. And so Dr. Yang, we, we both know yeah. well, um, attributes this to um, obviously the kidney where aging, you can see the aging mm -hmm. process through the kidney, and he it's sort of understands um, aging and hair color loss and everything mm -hmm. through and however he does it through yeah, yeah. the testing well, yeah. and the, the organs. But I, I really think the generations that 
are the most recent that we've, it's, it's millennials, Gen Z, mm -hmm. have such a burden with the environment we have more than you and I could yes. have ever had in our right. childhood. And I don't know that they have a choice to live any other lifestyle than what we are talking mm -hmm. about. And I literally try to frighten them whenever I speak yeah. to young people and say, you don't have a break. You mm -hmm. don't have a chance to, to smoke or to do any, to give yourself a break, mm -hmm. to have chocolate chip cookies and do all these things and indulge. You need to start changing your taste buds yep. to, to things that are healthy and looking at that as a treat and that as what you're giving yourself. What, what would you tell these generations that they should focus on first and foremost, and to try to avoid? So first of all, well, I think that's very wise advice, but first of all, um, people should be aware that environmental medicine is a subject that is not really stressed in medical education. So doctors are not, they're just not trained in this area, mm -hmm. and uh, they're also not able to stand up and counteract industry pressures on government, right. which have caused protections to weaken. So I think to whatever extent you can protect yourself, that's really important. Not smoking, obviously. Not being around secondhand smoke. Uh, drinking pure water. And you can buy relatively inexpensive water filters. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that's a very sensible thing mm -hmm. to do. And then as I said, when talking about the anti-inflammatory diet, the first step is to avoid eating refined, processed, and manufactured food. Uh, that kind of food has all sorts of additives in it, which aren't listed on the label. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what the effects of these things right. are long term or how they interact with each other. Uh, so I think that stuff is key. And then, um, I mean, obvious things like not keeping poisons around the home. You know, not when you smell fumes of volatile solvents, not exposing mm -hmm. yourself to that. I mean, that's all pretty sensible stuff. Um, I, and I also think if, you're, if you have a baby and you have a chance from birth. Or before. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You know, as soon as you know you're pregnant or thinking about coming pregnant, I think it's really important because it looks more and more as if environmental influences on the mother, you know, affect the baby. Hmm. So I think, yes, you want to take as many precautions as you can. Hmm. It's, a, it's a fascinating time because it's only more important. Everything you've ever talked about mm -hmm. is, is more relevant now and more important. Um, I think the um, the sustainability um, action, that call to action that we're all faced with in my industry and in many industries and in each of our lives is, is really important too because when you start practicing everything in your life mm -hmm. about care for the planet and caring for yourself, it sets a mindset on yep. how, how to behave. Yeah. Um, what do you know, I remember the first, I don't know if Michael Pollan had even written a book yet when you, when you no, first long, introduced long him. Before, right. I, I think about all the people you've introduced to the world yeah. um, who had an idea and a concept, and um, so he shared so much really yeah. vital new information yeah. about how we grow, how, yeah. we, how we farm. Um, What's happening now? Is there any new news or anything that you think is is important to talk about in the way that you brought all of Gee, these? Gee, you know, I, I am more and more concerned about plastics, and I think that the, to the extent that you can, you want to phase them out of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, don't store food in plastic containers. Use wax paper, you know, as much as possible. Um, just get rid of plastic things as much as possible. The plastics that we've thought were safe turn out not to be. So the ones that we now say are safe, you know, probably in the mm -hmm. future we're also going to look back that way. But in terms of both the environmental harm and what they do to us, you know, probably not good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned about artificial colors in food. Uh, I, I think those are fairly easy to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, some of it seems pretty obvious, but I, I think this kind of information, we should be teaching this to kindergarten kids yeah. and all the way up. 
No, I think they're very, I remember scaring, the guy I'm with has these adorable grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And um, and they just love candy uh -huh. and everything. And he said, please, Norma, can you just like chill a little bit until you get to know them better? <laughs> and then finally I had them alone and I said, so you want to be a soccer player. Uh -huh. You know colorful food will make you strong. And you can be a champion because champions eat like color. It. And so I started infiltrating. And I then like they it. were saying it in school. And I thought that was so easy. Yeah. It would be much harder to do it through yeah. parents. And so I, I think you need to develop a course for kids in school. I'm not kidding. No, I think serious. that's a high you're priority. The, right. You're the, 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 the authority. But if it. you teach that, the food served in the school has to be consistent with it and the other practices. So that's like a big, you know, a lot of stuff has to change there. But yes, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a major priority. I also think, um, you know, as you said before, a healthy lifestyle is sleep, diet, exercise, right? Mm -hmm. And stress and re neutralizing well, all, stress. Yeah. Right. So um, if, if that's what we focus on, we spend so much money on food because we eat too much food, mm -hmm. we eat too much of the crappy food. Mm -hmm. And I think if you just budget and buy better food, less of it, and eat quality right. food. And I think the same with the school system. Yeah. They just are not using the money effectively. Right. And uh, you know, you say uh, the money we spend on food, what about the money we spend on healthcare? You know, we spend more yeah. per capita on healthcare than any people in the world by a long shot, and we have worse health outcomes than any other developed nation. So what should we do with our healthcare system? Uh, you know, either we let it collapse and build something new. The problem is that uh, it's it's not a healthcare system, it's a disease management system. Right, you've been saying <laughs> yeah. that forever. <laughs> and it's not functioning very right. well. And the, most of the diseases we're trying to manage are lifestyle related diseases that could be prevented. So I think we have to ask ourselves, why can't we do a better job at prevention and health promotion? And I'm afraid the simple answer to that is they don't pay. Mm. So it's the priorities of reimbursement are completely upside down. But as dysfunctional as this system is, it's generating rivers of money. And that's going mm. to very few pockets. It's the pockets of the big pharmaceutical companies, the manufacturers of medical devices, and the big insurers. And they don't want anything to change. Mm. And they have total control of our elected representatives. So unless the only way I see that's going to change is if there is a grassroots movement, a social political change, and we begin electing different kinds of representatives. Um, I, I ha don't see that happening yet. I don't either. But I'm hoping that enlightened health professionals, such as the ones that we turn out from the University of Arizona mm -hmm. Center for Regroup Medicine, could help start that yeah. movement. Yeah, and I think that um, I think the best way for children to learn, obviously, is through the these devices yes. they're holding that you can't yes. get out of their clutches. Easy. So I think someone like you can. I think video so, games could be an exactly, amazing teaching tool exactly. where you could model, you could have an avatar, exactly. and you model healthy behavior and see what happens if you make this choice, yeah. you make that choice. As a game. As a game. And, that, right. and the, the choice that exactly. is, loses because, I, I, I totally agree, I don't think there's a better way to communicate Yeah, you right want to take now, advantage yeah. of that, right. So, this device, this the uh -huh. our iPhones, our mobile devices, they're so amazing. I can communicate yep. with China, I can communicate with Europe, all of my interactions, easy, wonderful. But we all know that it's having a devastating effect on our well-being, our interaction, right. our psyche. Yep. And we don't touch each other anymore. Right. When was the last time somebody <laughs> just did this, right? Yeah. It's so uncomfortable because we, we have this, this right. we have we have this in our hands all the time. Oh. And so I really I, I I think we need to talk more about it. And this is this is a big I hear I hear more talk about it than I used to. Clearly all this is changing brain function and I don't think we know exactly how. It's shortening attention span. I think it increases anxiety. Uh, I think uh, device addiction is one reason for insomnia and poor sleep. Um, as you say, it's like there's more virtual interaction and less real interaction. Mm -hmm. So this technology cuts both ways. In my own life, 
uh, I find that I have to find ways to limit my use. Yeah. So I try somewhere in the early afternoon to detach from a computer and not look at it again until the next day. I don't always succeed, but I try. And I think my cell phone I use relatively minimally compared to a lot of people that I see. But it takes constant work. Yeah. Yeah, I for me, because I'm in fittings and I'm sure. moving around a lot, I'm not at a computer. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my communication. But I don't look at it all day yeah. because I'm busy. Yeah. And then when I get to it, I have all this catching up. Of and course. And I <laughs> it's just, it's horrific. So yeah. I'm trying to create these... This is the time I put my phone to bed. I like it, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to have a, a time for that. I'm even going to make little sleeping bags that you put Excellent. the phone in good. so that there's a ritual <laughs> That's attached a good idea. or something. Yeah. But I'm, I'm definitely aware of the fact that there are people in a room with you who are looking at yeah, their phones yeah, when you're having a conversation. Like, yeah. And it's it's offensive. I couldn't agree and more. And then all of a sudden, I'm doing it. Yeah. And I think, what are you doing? I mean, this is, but it's so important. And yeah, it, it's But a, there's, there's a, a crisis in this area. I am in total agreement with that. So raising awareness about it is a good first step. Yeah, another topic for you. So uh, going back to the plastic. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, I agree. I've started to, I'm trying, you know, I live with someone who has habits and yeah. we have to sort of yeah, join yeah. together on this concept. Mm. But um, I've taken the plastic out. I have glass for everything. Mm -hmm. um, I have water filter jugs and we use that. But then he says, well, I'm not drinking soda anymore. I'm drinking coconut water. And there's like a refrigerator <laughs> full of plastic things with coconut water. So what, what, how do you see, I mean, he's right. I did, you know, he's not drinking soda yeah, anymore. Yeah, that's better. Um, but what, what, I think we need to develop this alternative thing for storage because we don't want to throw away right. food. We want solutions. Wax paper isn't available everywhere. Yeah. Um, what what do you like? What's a quick solution? Actually, wax paper should be available everywhere. I mean, it's just you know, people don't notice it anymore. That's it, what I grew up with. There's very little bit. Yes, <laughs> we both grew up with it, but there's like a very little section, if at yeah, all. Yeah, true. So uh, I, I think. That's something else for you to develop. Okay, good idea. It, it truly is, because yeah. there's you presented something very yeah. boldly, like, yes, it's even what we store food in, yeah. um, but people don't want to waste food, and they want to keep it, so how do you, how, what can we do? Um, obviously, glass. You know, I'm there. a great believer in, you know, in starting with small steps and building on that, because if you tell people to make global changes, they don't do yeah. it. Um, I think my book, Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, was successful because of that. I gave people yeah. simple stuff, you know, you build on incrementally. And it, when you look at nutrition in this country, we're in such a mess, it's hard to know even where to start. Mm -hmm. Where I would start is, is if we could get people to stop drinking sweet liquids, that would put us so far ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And it's not just soda, it's fruit juice, it's energy drinks, mm -hmm. it's putting sugar in coffee and tea. If we could work on that one, yeah. Even we'd, we'd smoothies. be much better. Oh, like yeah. What, what smoothies have turned right. into like ice cream sundaes? Or lattes that people <laughs> get that have like. <laughs> yeah, true. So it, I think that's a, a good one that, that I try to focus on getting people to be conscious about. What's your favorite smoothie that you make for I'm yourself? Not a, I'm not a smoothie drinker. You're not? No, I just am not. You know, my favorite, I, my favorite drink is water. Uh, and uh, next is, you know, matcha, which I'm a big fan of, Me matcha too. green tea. Yeah. Can I say a word about that? Please. Uh, I discovered matcha when I was 17. I went to Japan and lived with Japanese families. And the second night I was there, the mother of my host family took me next door to meet her neighbor. We didn't have any language in common. She was a tea ceremony practitioner. 
And I was just fascinated first by the whisk, which right. is just right. one of the most wonderful right. things I've ever seen. And then the color of the matcha right. and the liquid. So I came back to the States and I, you know, nobody knew anything about that here except mm -hmm. it's Japanese who practice tea ceremony. And each time I go to Japan, I bring matcha back and I turn people onto it. And now I'm just was amazed to see suddenly this has become a wave mm -hmm. here. However, most people have never tasted really good matcha. Yeah. You know, matcha goes bad quickly because it's finely powdered, it oxidizes. And it's not bright green and mm -hmm. it's bitter. So I was really interested in finding high quality matcha in Japan and making it available here. I got the uh, URL matcha.com, which was oh, a great kidding. coup. Yeah. Oh my God. I started a company called Matcha Kari and um, we bring in very high quality matcha from Uji, a town near Kyoto, which mm -hmm. is the, where mm -hmm. the best tea, matcha comes from. And uh, so I would urge people to check out that site, matcha.com, mm -hmm. and I have a discount code for your listeners. Oh, if great. Interested. It's great. NK15. Excellent. Put that in, you get a discount. Yeah. Try, try really good matcha because it's great. So matcha is the only form of tea in which you consume the whole leaf. And it's very high in antioxidants, in anti-inflammatory compounds, a lot of health research mm -hmm. on it. And it also, I think, just tastes terrific. So that's my next next favorite drink. Yeah, I, I love I love, I love that, yeah. right. Um, I, uh, I don't drink any sweet liquids. I grew up, I was addicted to Coca-Cola up through my 20s, I think. Now I can't even taste it. I know. It's just, I, I can't imagine that I drank mm -hmm. that. Uh, I drink alcohol m moderately. I like good red wine once in a while and Japanese sake. But the main advice that I give people about alcohol is be moderate, which means I think giving yourself, if you drink, say, two to three alcohol-free days a week. Um, but those are my main beverages. Mm -hmm. you know. So I I'm not a smoothie person. Uh, and uh, I think that's really it. So um, the reason I asked you is, of course, I'm in the New York environment. So... Right hectic run 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 yeah, run yeah, run yeah. and i want to be sure that i'm getting nutrition mm -hmm. and i'm missing uh sitting down and having a meal so i my favorite so, is avocado yeah. a whole bunch of greens yeah. some nutritional powders a little bit of blueberry that's or fine. raspberry that's fine and it's it's so delicious. No, that's fine. If you make it up, you know, that's great. No, Without I, the yeah. many, Now, many. one, you know, I meet people that are really into juicing, and they don't understand the difference between vegetable juices and fruit juices. Right, right. You know, fruit juices are concentrated <laughs> sugar sources. Yeah, totally. And, uh, and, in fact, there's a researcher at the University of California, San Francisco, um, who has been the one that's doing the most work on fructose which is not good for us. And I've heard him state, and this just blows people away, that drinking a glass of orange juice, whether it's fresh, frozen from concentrate, is the same as drinking a glass yeah. of Coca-Cola from yeah. the point of sugar view shock. of the pancreas. It's right. like sugar shock completely. And, you know, uh, some years ago, like, a grassroots movement, grassroots movement is going to be very effective, got soda vending machines out of schools in California, mm. and they were replaced with fruit juice vending machines. I know, I saw that. Not, not a step up. Tea. Or sweet tea. In New York, right. it was sweet tea. Re even in New York, I thought it was New just in the sweet South. Sweet tea. <laughs> I'm I'm work with the public schools. Sweet Amazing. tea. I'm Amazing. like, excuse me. Right. What's that? Yeah. So again, I so I would <clears> say you know I think smoothies, juice is fine if you're cautious about yeah. the fruit the, content. The amount of that. fruit that yeah. they put in. There's a place up the street, and it's like, my assistant said, look, I'm finally having a smoothie. And I was like, what is in that? And she went through every fruit. I said. Yeah. Just throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> I will buy you yeah. something in its place. Anyway, that so a big question, um, and and I don't know if I've ever even had this conversation with you or or heard you specifically talk about this. So, because I'm going to be seventy four, I have gone through perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, <laughs> post postmenopause. <laughs> And all I can say is, everybody says you're so mellow, and it's like, guess why? I'm 74. I am not being roller coastered by right. my hormones. Yeah, yeah. And I think more and more questions are asked of me about what I'm doing. And one thing for women I know for sure is alcohol is a real no-no. Mm -hmm. Like this period, you just forget mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It is not going to help you. Obviously, no sugar. Obviously, um, smoking and any of that stuff yep. that we've talked about is absolutely out. 
exercise, and there are many types of exercises at this period that are helpful, and exercise is a big thing for me. But what advice would you give women? And this is obviously a question I'm going to ask all the doctor, women doctors for women, but your perspective is so unique in that group. How, how do you... Well, first of all, uh, let me say something about hormones and hormone replacement. Uh, I think we're going to look back on the late 20th century when we pushed hormone replacement on women at menopause as one of the great mistakes in modern medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we, all, we assumed that there were benefits that we didn't have evidence for, and we were very well aware of the risks. And it turns out that the risks greatly exceed the benefits, except in rare cases when women have intractable menopausal symptoms or mm -hmm. if they have premature menopause, surgical menopause, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I think one of the ways that women were seduced into taking hormone replacement uh, was the belief that somehow at menopause you lose your attractiveness and vitality mm -hmm. and that hormones are going to make up for that. And that's absolutely not so. Right. I mean, you can see as many women, postmenopausal women, who are never taking hormones, who are, you know, attractive mm -hmm. and vital. Uh, and so that's the first thing I would say. Right. You know, secondly, you know, bodies change, and in men as well as women as you get older. And I think it's very important to pay attention to changes in your body and modify your lifestyle accordingly. Mm -hmm. You know, with regard to exercise, I have seen so many people not pay attention to signals they got from the body that the form of exercise they were doing was no longer they right for them. Change, yeah. And then they injured themselves in a way that really limit the possibilities yeah. for exercise. Yeah. You know, in my, I was a runner in my 20s, and then mm. I got signals from my knees that they didn't like that, and I shifted to cycling. And then uh, more recently, I became a swimmer, and that, that suits me mm -hmm. very well. So I swim every day, and I have two big dogs that take me for walks in the morning. Walking, by the way, is a perfectly good exercise mm -hmm. if you do enough of of it and vigorously yeah. enough, you know, your body is designed to do that. It's great. Mm. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned about alcohol in women. You know, women are are more sensitive to certain yeah. things than men. And uh, we know that uh, women that have, for other reasons, breast cancer risk, that alcohol is really a dangerous thing mm -hmm. to have in your life. And it may be that a lot of these environmental concerns affect women. Mm -hmm. more than they do men. So I think it's very good yeah. to be attentive to that. Yeah, I, I think the safe side for women is <clears throat> just don't. Yeah. I mean, it, and it, there's sugar. I mean, there's, it's, it, it's just not, women are so sensitive during this period. Yeah. Why even go there? Yeah. Um, I, I think um, movement of yeah, any very, kind is really important. key and that very we have important. to keep moving yep. but the ultimate i think and i'm curious about your your thoughts on this the ultimate to me is what is your life purpose mm -hmm. what is your purpose if you don't have that I you can't get through absolutely shit. <laughs> absolutely it, right? Yeah, right is that not ultimate uh, absolutely it? Right, I couldn't agree more. And I think that people that have life purpose are likely to live longer and live better. I think that's absolutely key. Another thing I would add, um, my mother, who died at 93 and was really good up until her last year, she always said that it's really important to laugh and you should never stop uh, being able to see the ridiculous side of things. Yes. And I think that's very good advice as well. You know, it's so funny you bring that up because that's my big thing right now. I spend a lot of time in London for my work and in Manchester. And Manchester is a cloudy, rainy yeah, I can city. Imagine, right. But the people there are so much fun. They're laughing all the time. Their intention when they meet you is to make you laugh <laughs> and great. to make you happy. Uh -huh. And then, and in London too, it's so ironic and it's so self deprecating yeah. and it's great. And then I come back here and we've become the most tightly wound <laughs> country. We're like ready to snap. And women, unfortunately, yeah. have become even more yeah. intense and tightly wound. And I am desperate for laughter. And I remember in the 70s, we would go to comedy clubs all the time yeah, yeah, and yeah. do that. But I, I, and so now I'm on Netflix watching 
Jerry Seinfeld, right, comedians in cars or whatever, <laughs> because I feel deprived. And I, and I think that what you said is that having a laugh, your mother's word of words of wisdom, mm -hmm. are so relevant today. You just made me think of a memory I haven't thought of in a long time. This must be, that must have been around 1985. I was in China. I Maybe mean, earlier. It was when everyone was in blue jackets and riding right. bicycles. And we went to. We were in Shanghai and went to a functioning Zen Buddhist temple. There are not many functioning <laughs> Buddhist temples, especially Zen yeah. ones. Yeah. And we we're in the courtyard, and it was at some change of something or other. And out came this line of monks, young monks who had their heads down and had such grim looks on their faces. There must have been 30 of them. They filed out. And then at the very end was the senior, whatever he was, the abbot, who was like a round, happy, he was laughing and waving to us. And, and you know, it was just so mm -hmm. obvious that he was, you know, the enlightened one in yeah. the group. Well, I mean, I, I think we need to sing and laugh and dance mm -hmm. more. Yeah. I just feel like everything's sort of closed in. And how do you negotiate when you can't have a or, joke? Well, or... here's what I would say is that, and this is advice that I give people, is to seek out the company of of people in whose presence you feel happy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you hang around people who are glum, you're going to feel glum. It's such an easy thing to do. That same thing is like, you know, when you look at, I, I wrote a book about emotional well-being, spontaneous happiness, and one of the things I talked about there is that to pay attention to what you let into your mm -hmm. mental sphere. I mean, if you read sad books all mm -hmm. the time right. and watch television news and hang around people who yeah. are gloomy, you take that on. Mm. Moods are contagious. So I think a very simple one is to pay attention to who you spend time with. Yeah. And by the way, that's also for health habits. If you want to develop better health habits, spend time with people who have them. Yeah. You want to have better exercise habits, spend time in the company of people who are physically mm -hmm. active. You want to eat well, spend time with people who have good eating habits. Um, when you come to New York, how often do you come? Well, uh, no pattern, but I'm usually here three or four times a year. So your environment is much different. Right. And, um, the pace is different. So what advice would you give big city like New York? Let me first say, I grew up in Philadelphia. And uh, my parents, we would come over to New York periodically. So from the time that I was very little, New York was like heaven to me. It was the most wonderful place. I remember the excitement that I would feel coming through the tunnel uh, or on the train or in the car. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I think up through my college years, I still had them whenever I came into the city, that sense of you know right. excitement, wow. In more recent years, it's like, how soon can I get out of here? You know, it's mm -hmm. a tough environment. Yeah. Uh, the noise, the, the rush, you know, it's amazing that it, the city makes it from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, I think you have to be on your guard. I, I mean, obviously, it's a great place for walking. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I can't exercise in other ways, I walk yeah, a lot in the city. Yeah, it's great. And the food choices are also amazing if you're conscious and careful about yeah. what you do. Yeah. And again, I try to hang out with people who are fun to be with. Yeah, it's a, it is a tough city, um, and I think um, it's also very exciting and stimulating yeah. because you get to interact with every race, color, yep. Yep. Uh, sound of the, I, I, I'm, I have a New York accent, and you probably have only heard me in this trip <laughs> and nobody else with a New York accent. So it's so exciting to have that, and it's really important for your humanity to interact. Right. But then there's like... So you've got Central Park. We do. So yes. take advantage of that because, mm -hmm. you know, we are, I think, more and more realize the importance of connecting with nature. Right. Uh, you know, there's even this term nature deficit disorder that's mm -hmm. been proposed now yeah. about how, you know, affecting kids. Uh, and you know about this whole concept of Japanese forest bathing as a therapy. No, Have you what heard is that? that? Uh -uh. Look it up. It's called forest bathing. It was a concept that started in Japan, and it's just having people go into forests and sitting and taking in the sights and smells and feel and, and this being and very I, good for physical and mental health is this nude bathing no 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 no, no. it's just no you don't no, no, wear anything no you just you just no you're 
<laughs> bathing in the forest environment. <laughs> Although that can be that can be good too. I can see that. Right. Uh, but you know, when you're for me, uh, being in, in having access to beautiful natural environments yeah. is very important. Um, that's one reason that you know I, I like where I live in Tucson mm. and I spend the summers in British Columbia, which is a nice contrast. I'm headed there really? tomorrow. Yeah. Anyway, but in New York. You've got, I mean, Central Park is magnificent. Imagine mm -hmm. what the city would be like without yeah. that. So if you, even if you just get out there for a walk yeah. or a lunch break, and, you know, obviously in spring when things are flowering, it's tremendous. It's but at all times, another place that probably fewer people go to is the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx. Beautiful. I'm on the, actually on their advisory board. Oh, you and, really? Yeah, and I love that place. Yeah. And that's like a complete escape into mm -hmm. a fabulous natural yeah. environment, a quick train ride out there. So I think seeking those things out, that's a good, mm. good suggestion. I, I, for me, the, the most important thing is water, to yep. see water and sunset. So yep. I, I grew up on one side of Manhattan, and there was, I would sketch by the water, yeah. and now I'm on the other side, and it's so helpful. But I remember coming out um, to Arizona and never really understanding the desert. Yeah. And I remember walking in the desert and just walking and walking, and I have the worst sense of direction. <laughs> and one cactus looked like another, and I thought, I am so screwed. I don't know how I'm going to get out of here. But the silence mm -hmm. was so profound because I, I'm used to this noise. Right. This is my silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was really, really so helpful to just mm -hmm. have total silence. Mm -hmm. I grew up, well, as I said, in Philadelphia, and I always had lived near the ocean or on the ocean in Boston and San Francisco. And when I moved to Tucson, that's the first time I lived really far inland. But something about being able to see infinite space satisfied whatever that yeah. need, need was. That, and that's what I thought, too, that yeah. when I was seeing that. And then I was just in the desert. I was in the Sahara overnight. Uh -huh. um, and it was it was as if it were water, right. but it was sand, and the silence was just the most calming, relaxed. Yes. It was just and that's a rare so thing cool. for many of yeah. us, you know, to, have to think that that's a luxury, <laughs> right. and that one we can love. So, what in your childhood? Now that we know you're from Philadelphia, and we know your mother was a wise woman, what what? What in your childhood do you think inspired you to go down this road? I know you Yeah, I, I think I was, you know, I came to the world a curious person. And my, fortunately, my parents encouraged my curiosity and told me to find my own path. And I grew up in a row house in Philadelphia, which was, you know, very different from the places that I live now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, however, it was a very tight neighborhood. You yeah. know, in, in the summer nights, people would sit out on the yeah, stoops. Yeah, I and grew up in the same So it was thing. like, you yeah. know, and that's something I, I miss, having that community, which yeah. I think is as important right. as, you know, laughter and all the other yeah. things we talked about. Um, so uh, I, I, I didn't think I wanted to be a doctor. I, I was interested in scientific things. I wanted to know about human beings. I had a family doctor, a general practitioner, who really mentored me and encouraged me in the direction of medicine. Um, so I don't know. I just sort of, I, I think, really followed my own path mm -hmm. and explored. I was always interested in exploring and being curious. And um, what what did your dad do? Mom? My parents together ran a millinery supply store, Stop. Ladies Hats, in that downtown is so Philadelphia. Funny. I couldn't think of anything less interesting. I wanted to have a delicatessen, <laughs> <laughs> and it was Ladies Hats. And they uh, and all I heard growing up was that women aren't wearing hats anymore. anymore. Yeah, you know. So they were in a, a business yeah. that was really tough, and they yeah. worked hard, uh, you know, but did okay. And there was a period when I was writing books and. Uh, you know, it was, I had a really hard time getting a wide readership. And I knew that what I was writing was important and ought to be. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a, an agent in New York, very top agent, who I don't think was that interested in what I did. And I was moaning to her. And she said, well, you know, people aren't reading books anymore. And that, <laughs> oh, no. that had a horrible, <laughs> no. horribly familiar sound. <laughs> if you think about when you started writing and, and talking about this, the audience was just minuscule. Minuscule. And you were just, your voice was so loud and mm -hmm. so strong that, um, it, and, and powerful, 
that you really drew people to you. But I mean, interesting, I, no medical colleagues. You know, there was a uh, long period when I got a larger and larger following in the general public, but none of my medical yeah, colleagues paid I, I any attention that. to what I was saying. I, and I found, um, I was moving, and I found a case of all these little notebooks where I took notes in all of your... I, <laughs> oh, I love it. I did. I took copious notes. Great. I was like, oh, my God, I've never heard anything like this. This is unbelievable. Uh -huh. and, and I think about that, the will to persevere. Well, I, knew I, was, I knew I was right. And How this did is what you I know? Had, it's my inner, my inner guidance. I mean, I've never, I've really never had a guru or master. It's always been my inner voice that I've paid yeah. attention to. And uh, who else? Uh, I mean, you were very early, but I, I there was a you know Bernie Siegel wrote a book. I remember that was yeah. one of the early ones. There was uh, Norman Cousins of the Saturday Review who wrote oh that book, which God. was really about laughing yes, himself, yes. you know, to health from yes. an autoimmune condition. So there were there were a few of these things, but none of them ever got traction within medicine. No, and uh, you know I just persevered until healthcare began to get so desperate that that people began to pay attention yeah, to what I was yeah. saying. Um, I, and I think that there's, there's a, a lot to say for people, this is sort of aside from what you do, but that the person is so key, the, the person that can persevere, can set a path that mm -hmm. has never been walked before, can have the determination and the conviction it, it's really, it's very unique and rare, and um, and I guess why I was so attracted to what you were doing, because I thought, this man is really a pioneer to just keep going, and no matter what anybody was saying, yep. you almost laughed and said, well, how about this? <laughs> and, and more and more people kept coming and coming, and so now that the world believes wellness is a good thing. My observation, and I want to know what you think, my observation is there is so much that seems a little less authentic than yeah. you would like it to be. Yeah. There's maybe too much, and sometimes simpler is better. And yep. So what's your observation now? I think, first of all, there is too much information. There's too much misinformation and disinformation and I think people are confused if you just look at diet and nutrition uh, I see so many people throw up their hands and say you know what well, doesn't matter they told us you know butter was bad and now it's good right. and, and now low-fat diets right. don't work so you may as doesn't matter you may as well eat everything and that's not true we have mm -hmm. very good information we know like what good fats and bad fats are what good carbs right. and bad fat carbs are so I think you need to seek out reliable sources of information. I've always tried to provide that in my books or on my website, drwild.com, in a newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've trained at our center at the University of Arizona. We've now graduated 1,800 wow. uh, physicians from very intensive two-year wow. training in integrative medicine. They're in practice all over and in other countries. And we've got our curriculum now in 80 residencies around the country and in Canada and Taiwan and Germany. So, you know, it's growing. So there are going to be more and more health professionals right. out there who, who can be good guides. How can people find them? If you go to the, uh, the center's website, which is integrativemedicine.arizona.edu, uh, you can read about all the courses we offer, including some for the public online. But there's a link to find a practitioner. Right. And you can put in your state or city and find a graduate. Mm -hmm. Any New York? Uh, yes, there are New York. Although I must say New York is less well served than a lot of other areas of the country, which is too bad. We need it. You need it. We need it. You yeah. have to tell me who. And okay, we'll, we'll do. Like, yeah. We need a really stoic I know strong I know you need it your need is greater <laughs> so and needful. your need is greater and there's so many people here so yeah, yeah, yeah it'll happen so um with with all of this information I, I think it's a typical example is CBD mm -hmm. all <laughs> on every street in corner everything, now. <laughs> right in the coffee shop yeah. at the desk brownies and I was in London, and they have croissants. With, no. Yes. So, so I, I just look at it, and I think 
Am I observing a plot to take over America <laughs> and will numb everybody first? <laughs> Doesn't that look, I mean, it's so obvious to me. Is this like, oh, oh, am I the only one that's saying, wait a minute? I mean, do we need well, to be Well, definitely numb? wait a minute. First of all, we don't, the only proved uh, effectiveness for CBD is for the treatment of seizures in kids that don't respond yes. to conventional medicines. And all the other claimed uses, we don't really have evidence for it. It's probably safe, but I don't know how to advise people about it. I don't know what these products are, what they have in them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a free for all out there. And you don't know if it's hemp or marijuana. Exactly. You don't, in food, there's no label, right. there's nothing. And I just think if it's accessible and kids can get it, yeah. then we start this belief that having the, the numbing, yeah. I just see it as the numbing. Well, there's another form of numbing that's even more uh, you know, prevalent out there, and that is antidepressant drugs. Um, oh my God! You know, we first of all, they don't work that. that well. So uh, why don't they work? Well, it's become harder. First, I think the theory in which they're based is probably not right. That it's not a matter of serotonin deficiency, but there has been more and more research showing that you really can't distinguish their effects from placebos. Uh, and maybe only in very, very severe depression are they useful. And also, if you give them long term, they actually intensify or prolong depression. Mm. And now, as this information has gotten out that, that these antidepressants don't work, so what, what do they do? You add another drug, an antipsychotic drug. I could not believe that oh when that started God. to happen. These are drugs that were developed for schizophrenia and major psychosis. They're now handed out as first line interventions to make the antidepressant work better. And, you know, I have a number of people, especially here in New York, who, know, who tell me they notice at dinner parties that the people, the, the people, the few people who really are upset about the environment and things like that are the ones who are not medicated. And the ones that are medicated, yeah. it's, you know, they're complacent. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so concerned about it. I, but I do have a, a quick sort of question to get back to yeah. this. So serotonin depletion. So in menopause, there's mm -hmm. serotonin depletion. So how, what would you recommend? Well, to... I think exercise raises so, that yeah. and nutrition and all sorts of things. I think that the problem when you give, and this is a problem with many of the medications we use, if you give a drug for any length of time, the body is going to react against it. So if you give a drug that boosts serotonin in the brain, the body's going to respond by making less serotonin and dropping serotonin receptors. So over time, you get yourself mm. into a worse position mm -hmm. than you had to begin with. So maybe for a very short-term management, a very severe depression, okay, but longer term, yeah. that's so not the it, way to so do it. So then just... And by the way, also the other great concern is about the use of these psychiatric drugs in kids. You know, there's... there's mm pictures of kids lining up in class to I get know. their medication like patients in a psych ward and we have no idea what these do to the developing brain yeah you know my theory is so many people complain about millennials mm -hmm. they're different they don't work as lazy hard. they're right. lazy uh, my theory is that they have been literally taking too, uh -huh. Men, uh -huh. too much medication uh -huh. to yeah. soften some yeah. of the harshness yeah. of the world. Yeah. And I think it's more the medication. That's I'm convinced of yeah. it. I, I'm convinced I, yeah, of it. I hear you. Because people don't change that much, right. but there's a behavioral pattern mm -hmm. that I've noticed. It's not every millennial, but there's a pattern that is almost chemical mm -hmm. and and it's un, it, it's just so predictable it's the same kind huh. of thing happening and i'm so concerned about the numbing of america the drugs and the impact on human behavior right. that I, if a com country or some enemy from wherever yeah. wants to take us yeah. down just do I it hear you. i mean and and everywhere i turn i think Am I like? Am I sort of very paranoid thinking? No, I. There's I this, but there's something yeah. happening. Yeah, and uh, you know, given the state of the world, the state of the environment, we don't want numb people. We want people who are concerned and get it and motivated to action. So, which gets back to how do we have a grassroots uprising, mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. to? have a meditation once a day in the country, how to have 
a, almost a militant force to survive. It's going to take that. It's it's, it's, gonna it's take like that. military right. for yes. good, right. but using well-being and a healthy lifestyle to change what we have created, which is not good right now. Right. Well, I think it has to be catalyzed by a group of people who get it and are able to speak you know, articulately to others. And have tools. But I think it's bringing people together. Yes. And, um, I mean, you have an incredible network. You have a powerful network. And if I were to say, I want to join a force, mm -hmm. and now I've put you in the military, mm -hmm. and you're the general, mm -hmm. I really think, I mean, I am going to keep bothering you now about how Please. we create. OK, I'm good. I'm very we serious. Have, no, we have to. And I'll do the New York. Great. OK, you're on. <laughs> but I, I'm very serious about no, it. I agree. And I'm very I, totally. upset. Yes. And the, the numbing thing now has me scared, because yep. unless we're healthy, we're not going to be able to do anything yep. at all for our children, for this country, for the world, literally. So it's a deal. Let's uh, join forces uh, as um, best we can and, so we and have come to up keep, with some ideas. Yeah, yeah. We right. have to have a regular sort of meeting and we get crowds. Yep. You know Joel Osteen? Yes. I find him to be one of the most fascinating mm -hmm. human beings mm -hmm. I've ever met, I've ever oh, seen. Oh. I, I, by accident, have seen him um, on television, and I think, this is interesting. This is very interesting. His power is quite effective. He has a huge following, and everything he's saying makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's good stuff. It's, it's, it's a good way to live your life. I think that premise, not what he's saying necessarily, but I think that premise of having enough people yes. believe yes. of how, how important this is, this is like God. Yeah. It's what God would want, I right? Agree. I agree. Or, or the universal yep. God, whoever, yep. or yep. if it's whoever. God, I don't know right. who it is. But, but that of just leading a healthy life. So, 120, I understand, is the age that cells keep reproducing mm -hmm. until. Mm -hmm. So I've decided that I want to try to live. In fact, I want to live to 120. So having said that, I decide every day if I'm going to do that, I better like think about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Am I taking care of myself? Am I doing the right thing? Am I looking after this, this sort of goal? There's a realistic aspect to that yeah. that I'm aware of, but I think having my goal be there, um, I don't think bad things will happen, mm -hmm. but having that goal. Tell me what you know about 120. Well, that seems to be where the human lifespan is fixed. Um, by the way, as an aside, uh, I, when I was writing my book on healthy aging, I came across a survey that was done by aging, an aging researcher who sent a survey to his colleagues who were in aging research around the country. And one of the questions was, if you could live as long as you wanted and be healthy, how long would you want to live? And the answers came back, and there was a great disparity in gender difference in how that people answered. Uh, men on average said they'd like to live a thousand years. Oh, really? Women on average <laughs> said they'd like to live 120 years. And the person who conducted the survey said he couldn't figure out a reason for the difference. Well, I thought about it. I think it's not that hard. You know, in our society, women are the caregivers. So if you're being taken care of, why not live to a thousand right, years? Right. On the other hand, women, <laughs> <laughs> women seem to want to live only to, to know that their grandchildren were going to be okay. And then they want it out of here. Very interesting. Wow. Now, personally, I don't think it's longevity. I think it's like, you know, how long you can live well and, and yeah. fulfill your purpose, right. as we talked right. about. Right. Um, so I, I, I absolutely don't believe in anti-aging and trying to reverse no. the aging process no. or stop it. I think right. you want to embrace aging, yeah. look at what gets better with yeah. age, yeah. Uh, and all that. I agree. I, I'm, I totally am for that. And of course... My 120 vision is that I'm healthy, of course. and I'm so excited about the future yeah. that I'm 
Yes. So curious. I wanna. I wanna be a part of it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what excites me about it. But but it's very interesting that when you ask um, men what their dreams are, they have big dreams, and women are very cautious about their and dreams. And much more realistic. Yeah. <laughs> and but I think it's important, just like wanting to live to 120, to have that big dream because. Getting yep. there gets yep. you further yep. than the realistic yep. dream. So Good. thank you so much. Well, I look forward I, to uh, making that yes. journey with you and we, to doing stuff together. We have to. We have to definitely in, enlist a group and have a big following of people who want to yep. make sure that. Well, this is a we start. It is. Thank you so much. For Glad doing you asked this. me to come thank on. Thank you. Okay.